So turn with me this morning, we're going to continue uh, with part four of Brighter This Morning and the little subtitle this morning, you're going to love this. Uh, I'm so glad you're all in church this morning. We're talking this morning about temptations, tests, and trials. Temptations, tests, and trials. In Proverbs 4 verse 18, it says, the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn that shines brighter and brighter until it reaches full strength and glory in that perfect day. Please notice something really important this morning. It says the path of the righteous shines brighter and brighter. It doesn't say it gets easier and easier. Just bump the person next to you this morning. So are you listening? I've come to realize this in my own life, and it's sad that we have to admit this, but You know, social science, uh, the Bible, and everyone who studies human nature agrees that the human nature automatically takes the path of least resistance. We always take the path that will promise us the most comfort in the shortest time. How many know that's true of human nature? But getting better this morning, if we're going to get better in God, then I want you to know it's going to take a commitment on yours and my part to be Christ followers at any cost. That's gonna be the difference between whether you get better and brighter or whether your life just stagnates and fizzles out. Let me be clear in saying that this morning, that in week one of this series, we did establish that you cannot change yourself. And that when we change and and when we wanna get better, we cannot get better on our own. How many of you know that's true? It's, this, is not a, this is not a self-motivation course or, or, or a program on self-effort. I want you to know you and I get better as we look to Jesus. And our lives are established in his love. As a matter of fact, the more we understand how much God loves us, the more empowered we are to implement change in our lives. And not just change, lasting change that causes us to get better. Have a look with me quickly at Hebrews 12 verse 2. We just look at the first part there. It says, looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. So what does that mean? Here's the start and here's the end of building our faith. So we're looking to, we're looking to Jesus. And then it goes on. Uh, The last part of that verse says this, for the joy, say the joy, that was set before him, he endured the cross. So here's the biblical truth for this morning. If you, if you want to grasp the, the totality of the message this morning, here's the, the premise on which we're building. The biblical truth is this. We actually get better by going through things. What did Jesus have to go through? He had to endure the cross. And how did he endure the cross? Because there was this joy set before him. Do you know what that joy was? You, and you, and you. It says, for for that joy that was set before him, he was empowered to endure the cross, and he just got better and better. So I want you to know you're gonna go through things. How you go through things is your decision. Things are gonna happen. How many know we're living in a world and, and we're living in a real world? So I want you to know we actually get better by going through things and dealing with our lives on a daily basis. But most people spend their lives trying to go around things, trying to skirt things, trying to avoid things. And I want to encourage you this morning. Uh, look at the person next to you. Say this. Say, keep calm and get through this. Come on, say, I'm going through I really believe I have a a word from the Lord for you this morning, and and I believe it's going to empower you if you'll embrace it and listen to it. Let me take you to a very interesting scripture in the Old Testament that I think paints the picture uh, of what God is really saying to us this morning. Let's turn to Numbers 33, and we're going to read uh, verses 55 and have a look at this verse of scripture here. In the New King James, it says this, but if you do not drive out the inhabitants... Of the land from before you, then it shall be that those who you let remain will be irritants in your eyes 
thorns in your sides, and they shall arrest you in the land where you dwell. What was God saying to the children of Israel? He was saying, once you get into the promised land, there will be giants there. There will be things there that are designed to take you out. And if you don't deal with them, if you don't address them, if you don't confront them, if you don't master them, then they're going to be the very things that will irritate you, frustrate you, and harass you as your life moves forward. How many of you can relate to something in your life as you look back over your life where you knew you needed to address something in your life and you didn't? And later on, it comes back and it bites you. You know where. And that's really what God is saying is as we walk with God on this path of righteousness that God has laid out for us, he shines his light. Our lives start to get brighter and brighter. And as they get brighter and brighter, as we address things in our lives, we start to get better and better. That's why we're saying this. God wants those things that are bad in your life to move from bad to good. Would you look at the person next to you and just say bad? There's some bad stuff in your life. There's bad stuff in all of our lives. But God doesn't want you to accept that. God wants you at the right time as his Holy Spirit starts to prompt those things in your life to start trusting him to to move from bad to good, to move from good to better, and to move from better to betterest. Bestest. Betterer. Matthew 11, verse 12. Let's have a look at a scripture this morning as we build on what we're saying. The truth is this. We have to learn to go through things, to deal with the things in our lives that we face with. And how many of you know sometimes we don't want to? Have any of you ever felt like, you know what, I just want to go home, climb into bed, pull the duvet over my head and hope tomorrow everything's better? Oh, come on, church. Am I in the right place this morning? Has anyone ever felt like that? Is it just Mandy? And now let me tell you a secret. I've done that sometimes. I didn't just think about it. I actually did it. And you know what the scary thing is? I woke up the next morning, and guess what? It wasn't better. The same things were there that were there the day before. So look at Matthew 11, verse 12 with me this morning. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent, take it by force. Uh, As I was sitting through the men's conference from Friday night through to yesterday afternoon, I progressively got more and more nervous because I was like, this guy's used every scripture that I've got in my sermon this morning. I'm going to have to go home and change my whole sermon. And then I thought, no, I don't, because obviously God is speaking to his church. Amen. Matthew 11, verse 12. Now, If you go study this and you go read a whole lot of commentaries and you just dig a little deeper, you'll find there are two trains of thought when it comes to the scripture. The one group of scholars are saying this. They're saying that the kingdom of God is under an onslaught. The the enemy is trying to break down the kingdom of heaven. And then another school of thought are saying, well, the way you enter into heaven or into the kingdom is by being violent. And do you want to know who's right this morning? Okay, let's go on to the next scripture. Would would you like to know who's right this morning? They both are right. Both those interpretations are correct. Because how many of you know, after you got born again, for a lot of us, all hell broke loose. And you're like, I thought I was saved and I'm delivered and now I'm victorious. Why is everything going wrong? Yeah, because the enemy does not want you to get a hold of who Christ really is in your life. So the kingdom suffers violence. But here's the other thing, and I think this is where people that are already in the kingdom miss it. It says, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. Go study those two words, violence. You know what it actually means? It means to exert an energy equal to and greater than the energy that's been exerted against you. So how many of you want more of the kingdom of heaven this morning in your life? 
If you're not putting your hand up, you will today at the end of the service because it means you're not saved. If you're born again, you have a passion and a desire for more of God. How many of you want more of heaven in your life? Here's how it's gonna happen. You will need to exercise an equal and greater energy into your spiritual life than the enemy is exerting against you to try and stop you from moving forward into better things in your life. Come on, just pull in your stomach. Breathe in, put out your chest. Put up your muscles, say, I'm ready for you. When we choose to not fight, for better in our lives. We are also choosing to settle for less. That's what the scripture is saying. And, and okay, let me not get ahead of myself. Being sincere is about being honest with yourself and God about where you really are this morning and then starting to grasp where it is he wants you to go. The Bible actually shows three distinct ways that this happens in our lives. And how this happens is in our lives is this, is as we go through temptations, tests, and trials, and we apply the word of God to our lives, and we apply the principle of God's word to our lives, you know what happens? Through that temptation, test, and trial, you actually get stronger. You actually get better. Now, I know some of you don't wanna hear that because you're like, I want it to be easy. It's not gonna be easy. Because nothing worthwhile in this world comes to you easy. Would you look at the person next to you? Just say, it is not easy to be a believer this morning. But here's the truth. It is so worth it. It is so worth it. Because I want you to know the benefits outweigh the difficulties by far. So here's the truth this morning. God does not remove us from tests, trials, and temptations. What he does do is he gives us grace in them to apply his principles, address our attitudes, live by the values of his word, and as we apply them, we begin to walk in the victory that he's already won for us at Calvary. That's why, that's why this morning, James so confidently made this statement. And and when I see James one day, I always wanted to just go up to him and just give him a slap and say, well, was that joyful, brother? But now I understand why he said that in James 1. He said, count it all joy, my brethren, when you go into trials. I always thought he must have lost his marbles. Because who actually enjoys going through stuff? Anybody here enjoy going through stuff? No, because when you're going through it, it's not enjoyable. But he says you can count it as joy when you focus on the right things. You see, it's very important this morning that we begin to recognize that temptations, tests, and trials all have a different nature but they all work towards the same goal for you and I as believers. And what is that goal? To bring our lives to the perfection and the maturity that God desires for our lives. Turn with me to James chapter one, and and let's just break the scripture down a bit. We're gonna find something very interesting that brother James shares with us, which helps us to actually understand his statement. We'll start in verse two. My brethren, Count it all joy when you fall into, notice what it says, various trials. If you're taking notes, underline that this morning. That is a very important word. Take note when you fall into various trials, knowing, why do I count it joy? Because I know something. What do I know? That the testing of my faith produces patience. And I must let patience have its perfect work because if I do that, I will be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives liberally and without reproach and it will be given to him. 
Let's break this verse down. In verse two, in the King James, this is what it says in verse two. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. All right, divers temptations. So I went to look at the word divers. It is the Greek word poilikolos. And this is what it means. It means to be various in character. It means to be manifold or many. It actually has got the little word in the Greek, motley. Have you ever heard of the word motley? The only thing I could think of when I heard of the word motley was the motley crew, which was a band. So I went and, I've never looked up this word, I went and looked up the word motley in the dictionary. This is what it means. The word motley is to be varied in appearance or character. Essentially, it means to be completely different in kind, character, or shape. So this is what James was saying. When you fall into various manifold, different kinds of tests and trials, he wasn't just talking about one particular thing. He was actually lumping together tests, trials, and temptations. They all have the same goal, but they're all different in nature. Let me give you an example. Tests come to us because we need to pass them. Storms blow against us. Temptations rise up from within us. But James says, whenever that happens, you can count it joy. I want you to notice something very else, something else that's very powerful about this. Notice what he says. He says, when you fall into these various trials. The, the word fall is an interesting word. It means when you happen upon. It means to stumble into something that's all around you. It means to walk into something that surrounds you daily that you never saw before. How many of you went to bed one day thinking the world was great, you're on top of everything, God is good, and you woke up the next morning and literally within an hour of the first morning, you find yourself in a trial. What happened? You fell into a trial. In other words, it wasn't there, it was surrounding you, but you never saw it, and then one day, boom, it's there. So he's saying this, what we spend most of our time doing is trying to figure out why we're going through this trial. And he's saying, don't try and figure out why you're going through the trial, rather figure out what you're going to do in the trial that's going to help you to end it. Because it's subject to change. Everything in the natural is subject to change when we apply the word of God. Look at the person next to you, say, that is good news. How many of you made the decision that you're gonna do something about your physical appearance. You're gonna, you're gonna get fit or it's your New Year's resolution. You're gonna, you're gonna bulk up, you're gonna streamline. Any of you decided to get fit or to eat healthy? How many of you know the day you make that decision? And you drag your body to gym the next day and, 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 and your, your gym instructor says, okay, let's start with the six kilogram weights. And you're like, oh man, I'm so keen. And you're like, can't I use heavier ones? <laughs> and then the next morning you wake up and you're like, honey, honey, can you help me? I can't move. <laughs> you exerted your muscles to resistance because it's only through resistance that your muscles can grow. And here's the amazing thing. You need, you need to exert your muscles to varied kinds of weights and exercises or else you just get strong in one area and there's not a balanced growth in your health and body. It's exactly the same spiritually. Let's, let's, let's look at two Old Testament examples, just quickly for this, for this morning's instruction. Now, how many of you know of, the, of a guy named Joseph in the Old Testament? How many of you know Joseph? 
is an amazing guy. And, and the second one we're going to just review, review quickly is someone I'm sure you remember as well. His name is Samson. How, how many remember Samson? I remember one brother I was speaking to, one of my preacher friends, we were talking and, and he's got two daughters and we were talking, they were getting to the age where they're starting to date and, you know, getting ready to find a, a person. You know, for a dad, that's always a scary time. And, and, and I looked at him and I said, who would you rather your daughter marries? Joseph or Samson? How you know, it's a no-brainer. Joseph, any day of the week. Samson might have looked bigger, might have been more gifted, but how you know, Joseph had character and integrity. I'm not slotting Samson. I mean, Samson went on a journey. But yes, think about Joseph. Joseph went through all of these. He went through tests, temptations, and trials. And he flew through all of them, except for one. He passed, he failed the first test. When God gave him an incredible dream, he got a little bit arrogant and a little bit big-headed and he said, I'm going to share it with my brothers. Hey, Bruce, I'm going to be ruling over all of you. In other words, you're just nothing. I'm the kingpin. You've got no chance. And guess what happened? It landed him in a trial. They threw him in a pit. But from then on, I think he learned his lesson because through the trial of the pit, he passed the test. How you know, then he was put into part of his home and he had to endure the temptation of the richest and most wealthiest woman in the world at that time, flirting with him and saying, come sleep with me, it'll be great. And then, because he was honest, thrown into another trial. How many of you have gone through some trials and you're like, why am I going through this? I, all I ever do is just serve God. Well, look at Joseph. He endured that, you know, when I read that story the first time and I'm like, check it, this guy out. I mean, he has a lovely lady. And I mean, guys, already your imagination's gone to what she was wearing. Come on, take authority over those ungodly thoughts. There's this lovely lady dressed in her nighty. Oh, there I go. Um, and she says to Joseph, pull in. It's all good. I'm married to the wealthiest guy in the world. I can cover this. I've got this. And I read on and, and, I, and I see Joseph not only says res, resist and get behind me, he runs away from that temptation. I'm like, yo. And I, and I, was, I was jumping ahead because I'm like, man, God must have blessed this man after this. And I read on and I got more and more disappointed because he got thrown in prison for doing the right thing. And I think that resonates with some of us because we felt like, man, I really didn't deserve to go through this. I resisted the temptation. I did the right thing. Come on, church. And then he gets thrown in prison, and you know what? He deals with his attitude. He passes the test. He, he keeps serving God. He keeps honoring God. He stays faithful. And guess what happens? God starts to give him the interpretation of dreams and he interprets two dreams, the one's good, the one's bad. But the one that's good, he says to the guy, listen, when you get out of here, please remember me to the king. Just, just put in a good word for me. And I'm sure he was so excited when the time came and that guy was released. I always forget whether it was the butcher or the baker or the candlestick maker, but the guy who got out. <laughs> the guy who got out, he gets out and how you know, he forgets about Joseph. And again, Joseph is put into a test of character. Yeah, I gave my best. I gave this guy the way out. I gave him the good news, and now he forgets about me. But how many know God came through for Joseph? And God raised him up. He didn't just get better. He got the best. He got access to all the wealth of Egypt. He got Pharaoh's ring of authority. And God positioned him in the best place to fulfill his purpose in this. And then we look at Samson, and I, I don't want to take time to go through the whole of Samson, but how many you know he progressively failed the tests, gave into temptation, and let the trials and the storms of life knock him around? And instead of getting better, he just got worse and worse. Instead of his light getting brighter, it got dimmer. 
And at the end of the day, we, we celebrate Samson because he still cried out to God. And in the end, he ended as a hero, but it cost him his life. And he missed out on the benefits of living and serving God in an awesome way. So it's very important this morning as, as we go, and we'll probably do it over two weeks, it's very important that we learn to under, identify the spiritual nature of the things we're going through. Because if you don't identify the spiritual nature, you'll not be able to exercise the violent energy that you need in the right area to launch you through that trial so that your life gets better and stronger. Are you getting some help this morning? Are you glad you came to church? Yeah. Is the Lord speaking to you this morning? You see, when we start to understand the nature, the spiritual nature of what we're going through, it gives us clues as to how we can overcome and get better through that season and not allow that season to destroy us. It also highlights the dangers of what can happen if we don't. Now, here's the, here's the kicker in why I use these two examples. God doesn't get to choose whether you become Joseph or Samson. You choose. Hear me today. God doesn't choose whether you become Joseph or Samson. You choose. By the way you deal with the things in your life and the way you address the things in your life will determine whether you're gonna go the path of Joseph or the path of Samson. So let's, let's dig into these a, a little bit this morning. First, let's look at the word tests. And, and let's, let's go to a scripture here quickly, uh, a test. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 down to verse 7, we're looking at tests. Now, let me say this to you before we go to that scripture. God will test you. Please write that down. God will test you. Why does God test you? God doesn't test you to break you down. God doesn't test you to expose you. God tests you because he wants to approve you. God tests you because he wants to equip you. God tests you because he wants to build your character. God tests you because he wants to get you ready for the next level of living. Look at the person next to you. Say, God will test you. Now, I know some of you are like, okay, this is a new bowl, Pastor. Do you, want, do you really want me to eat out of it? Listen, God will test you. God will not promote you unless you pass his test. Here's the reality. Think about this. Israel went through the desert an 11-day journey. An 11-day journey took them 40 years. And the Bible says for 40 years they tempted God because they refused to address the things in their lives that were the giants that God knew would take them out if he let them into the promised land with those conditions. Touch the person next to you. You have to pass God's test. Now, you might say, Pastor, give me a scripture. I will, but, but let me just ask you something. Have any of you gone to school? <laughs> it's not a trick question. <laughs> How did you get to grade two? Sorry? How did you get to standard nine, which is now grade 11? Why did you write a test? To evaluate, now I know some of the tests you write at school are really stupid, but that aside, especially maths, that aside, that aside, you write the test to prove that you've learned the material and you know and understand it. So, so it's no different with God. The, the reason God tests you is not because he needs to know where you are. Heads up, God is all-knowing. He knows where you are. He wants you to write his test so that you can know where you are. And so he can help you to get where you need to be so that next time you have a test, 
you can pass it. Bump the next person next to you, say, pass your tests. So what is a test? A test is an opportunity to see what you have learned so that you can be approved to get to the next level of growth, the next step of destiny, or the next purpose in God. Now, I'm going to clarify these so you don't, don't get ahead of me, all right? I'm talking about tests, and I'll explain what tests we're talking about in a moment. But let's read 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1, and we will read down to verse 7 so we get the full context this morning. We'll read a little bit quickly. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain, but even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi. Listen to what Paul's saying. He was saying this was not easy. This was not a great journey, but it wasn't in vain. As, as we were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict, for our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness or from deceit. Look at the next verse. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God tests our heart. Listen to what Paul's saying. Paul's saying, the reason I had confidence to preach the gospel, the reason I have boldness in God is because God has approved me to do what I'm doing. And how did God approve me to do what I'm doing? God approved me to do what I'm doing because I passed the test when God tested my heart. So I wanna, I wanna ask you to look at the person next to you seriously now and say, have you passed your test? <laughs> I know this is, this is a rubber meets the road message. But I want you to know, church, if we are going to reach, if we're going to reach the heights that God wants us to as a church, I know you're sitting there and you're like, Pastor, why do you want the church to grow? It's lacquer. We're all happy. We enjoy it. We know each other. Everything's great. Well, there's another 500 people out in our community that aren't saved. And they want to enjoy it as much as you do. They want to, we want them to go to heaven. They might not know they want to go to heaven yet. Because I mean, you know, when you're serving the devil, you don't realize. <laughs> But we've got to bring that message to them. And here's the thing. You might think what you do doesn't make a difference, but it absolutely makes a difference. Because if God's called you to this church, then he's called you with something that you have that this church needs. Amen. That's why the greater pressure falls on Mandy and I. As the lead pastors of this church, we have a responsibility to pass God's tests. To walk in the obedience God's called us to walk in because if we don't do that, we'll never tap in to the fullness of what God, God has and some of you might very well miss your destiny because of our disobedience. How I many you know that's a serious thing? So Paul says this, he says, but God who tests our heart, for we neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor the cloak of covetousness, God is our witness, nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you, just as nursing mothers cherish her own children. Why do we go through the tests of God? Because God wants to temper our hearts. God wants to fashion our hearts. God wants to get us to a place that we realize that serving God and living in this earth is not about us, it's about Him, and it's about other people. If God just let me out of, the, out of the blocks when I was a young man in ministry, I probably would have destroyed more people than I helped. I don't like to admit it, but it's the truth. And you just have to ask Giles. Giles and his late wife, Maureen, were my first cell leaders. And they actually have to thank me in a way because I kept them on their knees in prayer, <laughs> seeking God, crying out to God for me. <laughs> I was going to thank you, but you need to thank me. <laughs> Not to mention my parents who were on their knees for the first 20 years of my life saying, Lord, what child did you give us? Why are you laughing? They, I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about my brothers. <laughs> so 
What do God's tests do in our lives? Maybe you want to write this down, the four Ps. God's tests prepare us for our incredible future. God's tests protect us from our future temptations. God's tests power us to face our trials with courage and boldness. And God's tests propel us to go for the best. This word test here in Corinthians that we just read, let me give you the word in the Greek. It's the Greek word dokimatso. And this is what it means. It means to test something in order to approve it. To allow, to discern, or to examine, or to be accounted. To be accounted. So God wants you and I to pass his test. Now, just, just before we move on this morning, I, I'll conclude with this and I'll just introduce my next one and then we'll, we'll pick it up next week because I don't want to start something that I can't explain. But let me talk to you about some of the tests God wants you to pass. I, I'm going to give you the top six. There are a lot more and you might not think these are the top six. Maybe you've got your own top six, but these are my top six that, that if I study the New Testament and I look at the examples of the Old Testament and I look at the characters that did great things for God, these to me are, the, are my top six. Are you ready for them? Number one, the test of faithfulness. God expects you to pass the test of faithfulness. What does that mean? When God gives you something to do, you see it through to the end. The test of faithfulness. And I want you to know that's difficult when the storms of life are blowing, temptation is coming against you, and everything in you wants to quit. And I'll, I'll, I'll share this good one with you because it's nice to share some of, the, some, of the, some of the victories as well. The reason Mandy and I have been released to be national overseers over Rhema, family churches nationally, is because we've been faithful to look after Rayma South Coast for 10 years. And I, I believe you me, you might not know, there were days we were gonna quit. There were days I wanted to quit. And I love what Tommy Barnett says. He says, it's okay to want to quit. He says, it's okay to want to quit every day. Just don't. Amen? How many of you have ever wanted to quit on whatever it was you were doing? Listen, when, when you get through that, you've just passed God's faithfulness test. Number two. Number two on God's hot list of tests we're going to pass. The test of commitment. The test of commitment. I've done this a few times, but I, I've really grown in this area, and I, I really hate doing this, and I try not to. Don't worry, pastor, we'll see you. We, we're definitely going to be at the men's conference. De definitely. Can't wait to be there. Okay, bro, that's awesome. Will you put your name down at the table? Yeah, absolutely, pastor. No, I will be there. He just didn't tell us which men's conference, which year he was talking about, because it wasn't the past three. commitment. If you say something, do it. Here's the key. Don't say something if you don't intend doing it. Let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. Bump the person issue. Say the test of commitment. Here's a nice one. Let's lump these two together. Pastor, I can't wait to serve in the church. Pastor, I'm, I, we love you and Mandy. <laughs> Just tell us whatever you want to do. Whatever you want us to, we, we'll just do it. As long as it's preaching or running a small group. But we're not going to tell you that. Whatever it is, Pastor, whatever it is. Okay, awesome. Would you be on Sunday at 6 and just help us? Oh, no, no, no. We can't be here at 6. You know, Sundays, no. Sundays, we, we normally sleep in on Sundays. Okay. Um, all right, why don't you serve in the children's church? We really, no, no, no. We're not called to children. Okay, so do you want to just tell us what it is you want to do for us? Okay, Pastor, you know what? We'll, we will. We'll serve as stewards. Awesome. 
Awesome. Now come to the steward leader. We want to just serve. Her. Pastor Larry and Mandy said we must. Oh, we're so excited. Okay, awesome. You're going to serve in the car park. Huh? <laughs> and, and I thought we'd be sitting up front helping. No, no, no. We want you to serve in the car Oh, no, I don't know. Maybe if I feel led to do something else. <laughs> just smile. Look at the person next to you. Oh, he's not talking about me. Or you start and you do great for the first three weeks. And then you realize the commitment it takes to be a servant of God. Okay, I'm not going to labor that one. I'm, I've got my big brown spoon out and time's running out. and You're going to let my tires down. If you are really upset, I drive the white double cab parked. <laughs> What's your number plate, Ravi? N- F- <laughs> NPF. All right. Okay, I'm wasting time here. Stop laughing. You're using up my time. All right, the third test on God's hot list. list the test of obedience and generosity. The test of obedience and generosity. Or we, we could call it what it really is, the test of selfishness. Just put that in brackets. I'm not going to elaborate on that because uh, we, we maybe we'll do that another time. Number five. Faithfulness. Oh, yes, number three. Number three. What have I done? Faithfulness, commitment. Oh, I missed one. Okay, number three. Actually, number three, which is now number four. The test of love. The love test. Pinch the person next to you and see if they know how to walk in love. I, I call this test, if you want to put brackets, the test of maturity. Because the greatest test of maturity this morning is whether you can walk in love when people aren't treating you properly. <laughs> Right, the test of love. These are just four tests that God will give you in your life. Okay, number five. Number five, the test of sincerity. The sincerity test. This is, I don't know if I always pass this test. Let me explain to you, like, this family's moved overseas now, so I can probably use this example and hope they don't listen to it. Oh, no, I'll just use an abstract one. Someone gives you a gift that they like. (laughs) And they think you'll like it. And they give it to you and it's wrapped up and you open it and you're like, thank you, brother, it's beautiful. Oh, we'll definitely hang it in a lounge. (laughs) Not ours, but someone's lounge. (laughs) <laughs> How many you know, the test of sincerity, I've I just got to be honest with you, I don't always pass that one, because when I'm faced with like, Pastor, do you like that shirt I gave you? I'm like, yeah, I'll probably use it in the garden <laughs> to wash my car, <laughs> but I you know, that's the test, because God says that we should be sincere and honest especially with our brothers in Christ. And so I think that's what I'm going to keep taking for a while. I am working on it though, okay. All right. The last one this morning. The test of thankfulness. The test of thankfulness. Wow. Wow. That's one I've passed a lot and failed many times. Because I don't think it's one that you just take once. You feel like your whole world's falling apart and you're like, what's going on? Where's God? And I trusted God and I spoke, I confessed my scripture three times today. And things don't get better, they get worse. Maybe just, listen, that's why I said at the start of this teaching, you and I need to learn to identify the spiritual nature of what we're going through because it'll help us to know what to do. Because very often, It's just a test. And when I respond 
instead of getting grouchy, complaining, and moaning, and I just stand up and I say, Lord, I don't understand this. Uh, I, I feel like I should have got the victory already, but Lord, I just want to thank you that I'm born again. Thank you that I have food today. Thank you. I, I'm not where I want to be, but thank you. I'm not where I could have been. And you pass the test of thankfulness. Listen, when you pass God's tests, he will promote you. Amen. Are you getting some help this morning? All right, my time is up and I, I really said to myself I won't go over, but now I have. But that's your fault. 1 Timothy 3.10, please let me just uh, complete this. 1 Timothy 3.10 says this. But let those also first be tested and then let them serve as deacons and be found blameless. You see, in the church sometimes, we get upset when, when the leadership wants to test our quality. But it's scriptural. That word test there is the same word that Paul used when it says God tests our heart. He says, you leaders, test those who will be leaders in your church. Now, let me close by saying this. Everyone and anyone is welcome in this church. With all your warts, your insecurities, your problems, your addictions, your bondages, whatever it is, come one, come all. Because God loves people. That door is open, you don't have to be perfect. Right, here's the thing. Once you come and you get saved, we want to invite you to start serving. Be a volunteer, serve. Because I promise you, if I never served, I never would be doing what I'm doing today. All right? But here's the thing. As you start to serve, understand that God will start to bring you to the place of conviction where there are things in your life that you need to deal with. And here's the reality. If you don't pass the test, you won't get the promotion. Amen? That's why I, I want to just encourage you as a church. And I'm not saying this in a place of arrogance. Absolute humility. We are pastoring this church because God approved us. And you should respect and honor the office that God has placed us in. Because we've been through some stuff. Amen? And I found it crazy that people will just go to some prophet who they've never heard of, don't even know who sanctioned them, don't even know if God sent them to get a prophecy for their life that very well could destroy them and they don't even check with the pastor, should I go, is this person known? Who's this person that I'm getting out to prophesy over my life? And I want you to know someone can prophesy over your life and destroy you spiritually in one second. I'm just pastoring you today because I love you and I'm committed to seeing you running around to all sorts of churches all over the place and then you wonder why your life's in a mess. Get planted in the church where God saved you. Get serving in the church. You might not like every word I bring. You might not, not like the red jacket Mandy wears sometimes. You... <laughs> but listen to me. My character was fashioned not just by the great pastor I had, but by the human pastor I had who did things wrong, said things wrong, and I had to walk and build my character in that. Like the first time he asked me to preach and then forgot. Yeah, yeah, I spent days, no, literally days fasting. Lord, give me a word. And I prepared and I, I wrote it out 72 times and I preached it to the mirror and I preached it to my children. I mean, I was fired up. Brian out bonkies got nothing on me. And I got there that evening and I was stirred up, fired up, blew up. Pastor Tony got up. Evening, everyone. All right, today we're going to be preaching. I'm like, okay, he's going to introduce me any second. 45 minutes later. I was devastated but I had to pass the test I got up afterwards I smiled I said pastor that was an awesome word thank you for preaching tonight fantastic cleaned up packed the dishes away went home bawled like a baby <laughs> no one knew listen about eight days later pastor Tony walks into my office he says brew I'm so sorry you were supposed to preach last week, and I completely forgot. We had a laugh. I said, it's fine, Pastor, take me for dinner. I'll stay on staff. <laughs> but I had to pass the test. Test of humility. Test of dashed dreams. 
It wasn't long after that he asked me to do a whole Sunday service. And God let me use the message there for that opportunity. So others might not see, but God sees. I know I've gone way over time, but I just feel God wanted me to share that with you. I hope you got some help. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Let's stand to our feet while we just wait on the Lord.